All right, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, um, we are at our last talk of the day. Hope you guys are still wide awake, able to listen, because this is a very cool talk. Um, so, I'm assuming that most of you have come to the conference as people who use Electron and not people who have developed Electron in the past. And um, in case you ever w wondered, you know, how can I, as a JavaScript developer, get into Electron, um, this is the talk for you. So as someone who has had to do this in the past, I feel like this is a very cool topic and a very tough one if you don't have someone who, you know, who's very experienced who can guide you through it. And luckily, we do have that. So um, our last speaker is Charles Kerr. He is, he is a engineer at Microsoft working on Electron Core. And um, he used to be my manager back when I was an intern at GitHub. Yeah. So um, everyone, please give it up for Charles. We have it. We have it. OK. So hi. As you said, I'm Charles Kerr. I'm one of the Electron maintainers. And as already said, I'm going to talk about why you should get involved with Electron development, too. So I'll go over why you would want to do that, how to do that, including the mechanics of getting and building the code, and probably most importantly, being able to find your way around it. And then we'll put these ideas into practice with a coding example. This talk takes about half an hour. And while it is about coding, there are lots of ways to get involved, even if you're not a coder. If you're bilingual, there's a project to translate our documentation. If you're involved with QA, we have a group of QA people from other Electron apps, and you can come and learn from each other. And if you have an app with a beta channel, and you want to help us find bugs in our betas, come talk to us. But if you are a coder, why get involved? Well, first, maybe you're like me, and you're a developer who uses more than one desktop. Maybe you like it when the apps that you run, uh, you use, run on all of them. And not many companies write native apps for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Maybe you want to put your skills to good use while learning new ones. Electron uses a lot of languages. We've got JavaScript, TypeScript, C++, Objective-C. Some of our scripts are in Python. We use native Windows APIs, native Mac APIs. On Linux, we use Dbus, POSIX, and GTK. Our tests use... I'm blanking out. Our tests use Chai. Our CI uses Docker. And there is just a list that goes on and on. I literally could not name them all. And maybe that sounds overwhelming. But if you get just one thing from this talk, I want you to understand that you can do good things on Electron, even if you only know one of those skills. And in the coding demo, I'm going to prove that. Nobody understands the whole list, so you're in good company. Electron's code is big, and it isn't always easy, but a lot of the time, it really is. So you can do good things, even if you're just starting out. Next, uh, maybe you are looking for better paying work. There are a lot of apps that ship on Electron, but when an application hits some weird bug in Electron, there aren't that many people who know how to dig deep into the code and fix it. Electron will be better off when more people have those skills, and the people who have those skills will probably be better off too. I heard the manager of one Electron app say that another team could take their Electron person away over that manager's dead body. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and related to those two, maybe you're looking for more interesting work. That long list that I just rattled off sounds scary if you think that you need to know all that before you can get started. But what if that's a list of things that you can cherry pick from of what you want to learn? That's kind of appealing. And lastly, power, influence. <laughs> Electron is a community-based project. Project. We've got a governance structure, a code of conduct. We've got maintainers around the world. But full time, there's really only about a dozen of us. Anyone in this room, if they wanted to invest the time, can go from having very little say to having a very prominent say in how the project works. As long as it's not to the detriment of others, we're very flexible. So if any of that sounded interesting, the next thing to do is to get the code. So what do you need? Well, as you know, Electron is Node plus Chromium plus features. 
And we compile all those sources together to ensure that everything's compatible. Everything needs to have the same compiler flags. And we also need to ensure that Chromium and Node are using the same version of V8. Oh, yeah, V8. Uh, Node has some dependencies, and we need to build those too. And so does Chromium. <laughs> and Chromium's dependencies have dependencies. <laughs> and when you add everything up, it's about 60 million lines of code. And for added fun, you can't just install them. Chromium's dependencies are not specified by version numbers. They're specified by commit hashes. And Chromium has custom patches for its dependencies, and those have to be applied before it builds. And Node patches V8 in the same way, and Electron patches both Node and Chromium in the same way. So it's complicated. Fortunately, uh, Chromium is a big project. They have a uh, people who wrote something called Depot Tools that does most of this wrangling. And Electron's documentation will show you how to do this manually. But uh, Sam and Shelley and I recently wrote Electron Build Tools, which includes a command line tool called E, which handles a lot of the minutia for you. It fetches Depot Tools and keeps it up to date. It has sensible defaults for Git caching. Uh, it tries to speed up your build by seeing if it can reuse pieces, pre-compiled pieces from our CI machine. And it does some other helpful things which we'll see later in this talk. So for those reasons, build tools is what I recommend. And we're going to make it an NPM package, but for today though, uh, installing it is still pretty easy. Uh, so, oops. It's not supposed to be there because I'm supposed to be installing it, so I'm just going to remove it and pretend that I haven't installed it. Okay, so now I'm back on script because I can say, which E? I don't have E. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to put in my electron directory. That path isn't required by any scripts. You can put it anywhere you like. Uh, and if you've used NPM apps, which probably all of you have, you've probably done this next part before. You git clone build tools, cd into it, and install. And that's all there is to it. I will add the source directory to my path, and now my shell knows where to find E. So, great. Now we've got E. Let's see what it can do. When you're getting started, so this, can you read all this? Yeah. Okay. When you're getting started, these first four commands are likely to be the first four that you'll use. E init creates a new project file. That file remembers where you told it you want the source code, whether to make it a test build or a release build. Uh, it sets up reasonable defaults for the build time environment variables. Uh, and when I say environment variables, like I say, E tries to just work, so you probably won't be changing these, but just to show you what I'm talking about, uh, you can see what gets injected by running E show ENV to show the environment. And so this git cache is what I was talking about when I say it tries to cache the code between uh, builds so that the next time you fetch code, it's faster. And SC cache is the tool that we use to try to speed up your build by reusing pieces from Electron CI. Uh, and also, you show current file name. We'll show you where your project file lives in case for some mad reason you wanted to edit it by, oops, edit it by hand. That's what the config file looks like. So next up. Sync does what it says. It synchronizes the code. If you haven't checked out the code yet, such as after running eInit for the first time, this will fetch it. If you've already checked it out, this will bring it up to date. So it's kind of like git pull. Um, you want to make sure to sync after checking out a different electron branch to make sure that the dependencies all match up. For example, if you are shipping with an old version of Electron, you want to go back to Electron 7 and you check out that branch of Electron, you run eSync because that older Electron code is going to want to compile against older Chrome and older Node code. 
The next two are pretty straightforward. EMake makes it and ERun runs it. Lastly, you can combine these three commands, init, sync, and make, by using the bootstrap parameter. So this means that eInit bootstrap is a one-liner to get you from scratch to an electron build. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to run uh, eInit with bootstrap. Wait a minute, that's not the right video. This is what I want to show you. And this is actually a video because this really takes like quite a while, so I'm cheating here. I'm going to speed it up. We time it to see how long it's going to take. So here, I'm telling it to store it in the covalence bug directory because when we get to the part of the, pro uh, part of the presentation where we go through a coding example, I'm going to fix a bug. It's going to be a testing build. I'm naming the project file after the same as the directory. And there is that bootstrap command to get everything from scratch. So when I run this, it's going to try to pick up those 60 million lines of code and build them. And that's about as fast as it sounds like it would be. So <laughs> that's why this is a video, because I can hit fast forward. And you can see we're 10 minutes in, 12 minutes in. At the 24 minute mark at the bottom here, you can see finished. And that means that it took 24 minutes to pull in that source code. Great, so we've got 60 million lines of code and we start building it. I don't know if you can see this on this screen, but we've got 33,000 objects that we need to build. So I am gonna hit fast forward again because let's get to happy hour as soon as we can, right? Okay, so it finishes, it took 2200 seconds to run the bootstrap, which means about 36 minutes if I remember right. So fetching the code took 24 minutes. And since we were able to reuse almost everything from our CI machine, that took about 10 minutes. Um, without the CI helping you out, this literally takes like four hours or more, depending on your hardware. OK. So hooray. With a bit of patience or the ability to cheat and speed up time, we now have you too can build Electron. Uh, which means that we now have code that we can look at. So we'll go to the root directory that we specified in eInit. Uh, and by the way, like I said with eShow, you can use this to query information from your current project file. So like say you did this yesterday and you don't remember what directory you put it in. You can say eShow root and it will show you where. And the nice thing about this is that you can script this. So, for example, you can say cd e show root. And when we get there, we get a directory full of I don't know what. Android, Chrome OS, Electron doesn't run on those. So what is all this stuff? Here's what's going on. Out of those 60 million lines, Electron is only about 70,000. That's less than one-tenth of one percent. Even Node, with all its dependencies, is only about 5 million lines. All of the rest is Chromium, or its dependencies, or its dependencies, dependencies. So doing things the Chromium way just makes life easier. It's got a lot of inertia. When we use its directory layout and build structure, things just flow better. So what you see here is more or less what a Chromium developer would see when they check out and try to build Chromium. The only difference is this little Electron directory here. That's where our one-tenth of one percent lives. And I'll look at that, we'll look at that in a minute, but the code in there is going to make a lot more sense if we run through some Chromium highlights real quick. So. These are the Chromium mod modules that Electron includes the most. And you don't have to remember all these. I will tell you which ones are really important. Um, and I mean include in the C++ sense, which is sort of like JavaScript's require or import. And if you're following along, CS Chromium Org is really useful. Click on that, opt into the new layout, 
and click on Chromium source, you will see a sidebar that shows the same directory structure that we've got here. And the reason that you want to be able to search that is Chromium's code base is so huge that if you tried to load it into an IDE and do IntelliSense or any searching on it, it will just make your IDE catch into flames. So this search engine is a really nice way of being able to find things quickly and intelligently move around the code without having your laptop melt down. Okay, so CS Chromium is your friend. The first module you should know about is base. These are general purpose tools that anyone else can use. This is where you'll find like string tokenizers, command line parsers, logging utilities, C++ polyfills. If you want to get familiar with the C++ code, this is the single best starting point because it's well written, it's all self-contained, and Electron uses it everywhere. Next up is Gin, which I think maybe Shelley mentioned earlier today, so maybe it doesn't need as much introduction. It's a lot of convenience utilities for dealing with V8. Um, this module is a lot more complex, but it still might be a good starter candidate if you want to learn more about V8, because Electron uses it everywhere too, and it's only a couple thousand lines, so that's not too bad. Blink is Chrome's famous rendering and layout engine, and it does a lot of heavy lifting for us. But although we include it a lot, um, most of the time it's just to pick up like structure class definitions or something. So although understanding Blink is really useful, um, in Electron at least, that's probably not where you'll spend most of your time. So I'm going to move on to graphics. These are fonts, color palettes, rounded rectangles. This builds on top of the 2D library Skia that Firefox also uses. And these next two are the more important ones, I think, for, uh, for Electron. Views, this is a fr framework for abstracting out native UI resources like windows and widgets, text fields, menus, that sort of thing. One of Electron's biggest advantages, obviously, is that, that gives, it gives you access to native features. So we have a lot of code that builds on top of views. Next, and this is the one that you want to pay the most attention to is content. Content describes itself as the core needed for a multi-process sandboxed renderer, which is kind of like an obfuscated sentence, I think. To me, this means that it's like a minimum viable code for a browser and a browser only. There's no extra features like spell check or printing or so on. And so this is here for someone like Chromium to come along and build an entire web browser around or someone like us to come along and build Electron around. Content has a public API and also a reference implementation named Content Shell, which renders, on all which renders pages on all platforms. If you're embedding Chromium in an application, this is where you start. And I will look at this a little bit more with you in the next slide. But to continue through, Components is next. This is where you'll find those bells and whistles that didn't make it into content. Um, they're important, but they're not intrinsic to the content itself. So here's where you'll find printing, translation, autofill, bookmarks, that kind of stuff. Really, it's a very long list. Think of every feature in Chromium that doesn't involve rendering, and it's there. Except services. Oh, dear. Why is it that highlighted? Last on the list is services. Uh, services reside in their own processes and communicate only via IPC. There's no link time or runtime exposure, which has obvious security advantages. It also has pragmatic advantages, like audio is a service. So it's fairly common for a system's audio to just die. If it dies, you can, uh, the service manager can just restart the audio process instead of having to restart the entire browser process. OK. All right, those are Chromium's main modules, at least as seen by Electron. Probably the Chromium developers might have a different opinion on like prioritizing these. And I want to finish the Chromium overview by going back into the, by going into the content module. So even just looking at the top level folders inside of content, there are a few important pattern, patterns here that repeat in the rest of Chromium and Electron. 
And these are why I said that electrons code will make more sense after we look at this stuff. And this stuff is like right behind me. So I'm going to see if I can just like move this over. All right. OK. So two things will, two of these names will probably look really familiar to you already, browser and renderer. Um, so I should thank Jeremy for his wonderful presentation before because he did a really good job of explaining these. You will have some number of renderers in running in your application and always one browser. The renderer handles rendering. The browser handles pretty much everything else, accessing native resources like UIs, uh, network, and disk I.O. And so content, this is where that separation of uh, resources comes from in Electron because it's because Electron really is just a content application. That's why even Electron's Hello World app, Electron Quick Start, has a main and renderer JS file. Uh, some of the other folders here also have patterns that repeat. Whoops, that's not what I want to do. Utility is for tasks that can be performed in a utility thread. App is for the scaffolding where you take all this embeddable stuff and turn it into an actual, actual executable that you can run. And common is pretty much what you'd expect. It's for code that's shared between these other folders. So if we look in the public directory, we see the same patterns playing out. This is where the public API resides. This is where the rest of Chromium subclasses its different Chromium implementations for different platforms from. That's why we had an Android directory in the top level. That's why we had a Chrome OS directory in the top level. Those all subclass from these public APIs. And that's exactly what Electron does too. That's how, it, but that's how Electron exists. And I really quickly want to point out the shell directory as well. Like I said, uh, content shell is a sort of a reference implementation of a content client. So sometimes when you're trying to understand a concept in Electron, this is a good reference to look at. And obviously it has the same sorts of patterns in it. Okay. So Electron's code has the same patterns and looking at it is going to go really quickly. But I know that was a lot to take in just now. So before we start, as a palate cleanser, here's a picture of a derpy cat. Oh, good. After Jeremy did that, I was wondering if that would work. Okay, I'm happy about that. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> okay, so moving back out of content, we're going to look in Electron now. And all right, so Electron has two main directories where it keeps its source code, lib and somewhere in here is shell. Like content shell, electron shell is our subclasses of contents public API that I referred to just a second ago. Um, basically, the code in here is an answer to the question, what would a contact application look like if it was also made up of node modules and it gave you full access to the desktop? And then we have lib, which is the JavaScript layer between Electron shell and your applications. This is where all the code lives for the Electron APIs that your applications import. If we can do it in JavaScript, it's in there. And we prefer it to do in JavaScript. Otherwise, we do it back in Electron shell. And so when we poke around in lib and shell, we're going to see the exact same division of labor and the exact same patterns again. And since the renderer process renders and the browser process handles most of the other things like native UI, it'll come as no surprise that the native UI code is in Electron Shell Browser. For example, here is the native Mac view. And in the Linux directory, Unity Services. And we've got the relauncher for Linux. So anyway, as you can see, the native pieces are here. This is all consistent with what we've talked about before and what Jeremy said about the division of security and how the renderer basically can't be trusted with these kinds of things. So putting this together, 
Say you get a crash and your debugger says it's in Electron Shell Atom Browser Client. And you think to yourself, well, I know all those words, but I have no idea what that means. <laughs> From the directory and the file name, you already know this is building on top of content. So you know where to look for a reference implementation. You also know where the parent class is. And the Chromium classes, the Chromium content classes are usually well commented. So you go in there and you open it up and you've learned that browser client is basically a catch-all escape hatch for embedders to fine-tune parts of the browser. Just to pick an example at random, which is what I did here, it lets embedders decide when an app cache can be used. And so you have a basic understanding of what's going on, at least in that file. Okay. One final thing about the code. I've mentioned a few times how large the code base is, and I know that that scares a lot of people off. So I want to show you this. Basically, I'm going to look at all of the C files and sort them by raw size. So again, this is like right behind me. Maybe I just scoot this over. So by far, this one is the largest. It's 92 whatevers instead of 52 whatevers. <laughs> and when we go in and read the, the dot H is just the class declaration as opposed to the implementation. So when we go in and look at what this, oh, when we go in and look at what this file is, it's basically implementations of things like stop, go back, go forward, is crashed, set user agent. So this is the biggest, scariest class in Electron by size. But when you look at what's in it, you may not know exactly how it works, but you've already got a real good idea of what it's doing if you've ever written an Electron application, or really if you've ever used a web browser. So although Electron takes a lot of time to learn, a lot of its code maps directly to concepts that you already know. Okay. So, uh, with the last five minutes, I'm going to do a quick coding example. I joined Electron because I wanted to learn more web tech. Before joining, I'd done a lot of code in Linux, uh, services, and desktop applications there. I guarantee you that this room understands writing web apps better than I did when I joined the team. But like I said, you can do good things on Electron, even with just one of those skills from the list that I gave earlier. And although I'm often really hard on myself, I do know that I have one of those skills. So with these five minutes, I'm going to show a quick demo of that. This is a bug that I fixed early on in Electron, and really the only skill I needed to fix it was a knowledge of a Linux GUI library named GTK. And don't worry, you don't need to know GTK to watch this. So the bug report was that on Linux, the alert dialog was showing the no symbol icon. And happily, that is really easy to test, which is probably why I picked it for this. So uh, we're going to use E again. As we went through before, it's looking at covalence bug hooray. Because I fixed this before, so I had to unfix it for this demo. Uh, and so we will run E debug inside of Electron Quick Start just to pull up a Hello World application. So E debug starts a debugger. Uh, the debugger that I have installed is Linux, uh, is GDB. And since GDB is quite slow, I'm just going to talk for a moment and fill time until it's ready. There we go. So I type R and then dot saying run Electron in the current directory, which is Electron Quick Start, which means Electron Quick Start should show up. And fantastic, it does. So I open DevTools and I will say alert, hello world, and Sure enough, we get the little cross through of the no symbol icon. So hooray, we have been able to reproduce the bug. Now, when I fixed this bug the first time, I had no idea where that code was. Um, if I had watched this talk, I would know that the native UI code is in Electron Shell Browser. But because that was two years ago, I had not given this talk yet. But I did know that whatever it was doing, that icon is getting shown by a call to GTK widget show. 
because that's how every GTK widget is shown. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the same test. I don't know why I quit because now I have to read the symbols all over again. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to make this window smaller so that maybe people can read it over the podium. So I start up Electron again, Electron Quick Start again, and I will open DevTools again and I will prime the alert command just as before. But instead of hitting enter, first I'm going to go back to the debugger and set a breakpoint for GTK widget show. And then continue on. So now when I do this, bang, we've got something. And so I can get a backtrace and find out where that crash happened. Okay. So. What's happening here, if you look on the right hand side, it says all of this stuff is in GTK. This is internals to the GTK library. That's not what we care about. What we want to do is follow this trace back up to, there's GTK message dialog new. That's good. That's where the dialog's coming from. And whoever called that is, here we go. So electron shell browser UI message box GTK. So that's where this bug is coming from. And that makes perfect sense, given that that's where the native UI stuff lives. So when we open that file up, what line was that? 41. We go to line 41. There's GTK message dialog new. So the first thing that I see is that message dialog has a type. And I know that depending on what type you set the dialog, sometimes GTK will set a default icon. So let's see what the type is to see if it's like a question dialogue or what it is. So I'm going to walk up the call chain. Oh, let me explain that a little bit better. It's asking settings type to see what type it is. And it says up here, settings was passed into the function. So whoever called this is the one who set the type. So what we do is we walk up the call chain There we go. And so I can just say print settings. And there we see that type is electron message box type K none. So no type meaning no icon. So we know that's not where the problem is. So let's look for the next uh, case of GTK widget show. The next one is happening, I'll scroll it up so that it's a little more visible inside something that checks for the icon and it sets the icon if it's there. Well, this sounds promising because it's the icon that's broken. So we go back and we look and see what the icon is. Unfortunately, the icon is a null pointer here. So no icon was passed in. So we know that this block doesn't get called because the icon is null. So this isn't where the problem is either. So we keep looking for GTK widget show. The next one is inside this checkbox label. Well, this isn't a checkbox, so we know that this isn't the problem. However, it's really easy to test this because checkbox label is the logic here. And we can just go back real quick and look and see, yes, checkbox label is an empty string. So that is not the issue. So we keep searching for GTK widget show. And we get to this one. In the show method, there is a, something a little different, GTK widget show all. Now this is really promising. Because GTK widget all, what it does is it tries to show the whole subtree of widgets of the UI components. So maybe what's happening is GTK message dialog always has an icon widget, but it's just hidden whenever the icon property is not set. If so, calling this would show the unset icon, and that would be consistent with the bug that we're seeing. So this sounds great. So let's see what happens if we remove that all. I'm just going to delete it there, save the file, and run emake. And I hope that I've done everything right setting this demo up. Otherwise, we're going to be here for another 10 minutes waiting for the build. 
we're not really. I have a, a backup. But I'll try to do it real first. How was it? Forget it. Eshow LS. This shows the different things that you can do. Uh, this shows the different uh, config files that we have. So I will just go over to covalence bug fixed. And that is exactly the same as what you just saw. It's, it, the only difference with the master code is that I removed that underscore ALL. So when we go back to Electron Quick Start and we run this version of the browser, oh no, I copied it over from here. Well, You know what's going to happen. It's just going to go away. So uh, <laughs> I know that it's working here. So let's just do that. Otherwise, we won't have closure. <laughs> no, I broke it everywhere. Okay. So. I know that this actually works because I had to re-break it for this demo, but clearly I didn't set it up correctly in order to finish this demo. <laughs> but the point still holds that I was able to track down that bug and despite what you see on this stage, I was able to fix it, <laughs> basically just knowing a little bit about GTK. And like I said, that's just one of those things that are on that whole list. And I guarantee that you all know like more about web development than I did then. Any of you, any of you can do good work with Electron. Hopefully better than this. <laughs> okay, so I think three times is enough. I'm going to skip past that and move to the closer. Thanks for listening. All right. So in case it didn't become clear, if you have any questions about deep electron internals, now would be a good time. There we go. Or we could go drink. <laughs> um, I'll be quick. So uh, presumably I fix a bug and then the next step is I just submit a pull request and hope that it gets accepted or? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Drink time. Uh, actually, I should say one more thing about that. Um, if you're wanting to contribute more on the regular, like if you have a one-time bug fix that's just scratching an itch that you have, um, opening up a PR is perfectly wonderful. We're never going to turn down PRs like that. Um, but if you are wanting to get more into the uh, contribution side, um, you should go to electron. Uh, oh, I should have it on this list, but I don't. But github.com slash electron slash governance. And that will show you how you can join the Electron Slack and how you can be in more contact with the other maintainers. For example, if you have a larger PR, like something that's going to take you a lot of work and you want to know whether it's going to be accepted before you start off on this journey, if you want to add new API that maybe you're not sure that we'll want because it's only useful on one particular thing, this is the place to come to talk to us, to join, and to uh, sell your feature. Okay. Hey, Charles. Hey, Jeremy. Say I'm uh, new to Electron, and I'm looking for a good first bug to work on. A good what? A good first bug. Is there some sort of a label that I could look at on GitHub? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. What a shame. <laughs> well, funny you should ask, Jeremy. <laughs> In the bug tracker, we do have a good first bug label. So if you go into github.org, electron, electron, and look at the issues, you can filter by label and you can look at the good first bugs. Thank you for asking. Okay. Uh, any other questions?
All right. Awesome. Give it up one more time for Charles. Charles, thank you so much. <laughs>